Good morning again, Pastor Josh. I'm the teaching pastor here at Hope Fellowship Church, and it's uh, my privilege to continue on in this series we've been going through together as we've been learning about enfolding and this idea of creating space for other people to belong. We're in Isaiah chapter 40. You already heard a couple of words from it. That's near the end. We're going to start at the very beginning of Isaiah chapter 40. So if you brought your Bible with you, I invite you to open it up. And um, if you haven't, you have your uh, electronic text. It'll also be on the screen uh, as well for your help. I will ask, I don't always ask this, but I sometimes ask this, keep the text open for you. I want to refer to it a few times, and it may help you in remembering some of these things that we're referring to. So if you keep that text open, it's okay if the neighbor beside you has their iPhone or whatever, click and it's, it's just the text, okay? Uh, we can make that agreement together. Well, when we started the series together, we learned a new word together. I'm not sure if you remember the word. Well, some of us learned a new word, I guess. The word was sucker or sucker. Remember this? Okay. Um, my, my iPhone didn't even have it in it when I went to go type it in. It was like, no iPhone, that's wrong. But we got there. It is uh, one of those words that's come out of circulation. It means help me or to help to the very core. And I thought to myself, you know what, that's another good word for this week as we think about the word comfort. As we've been going through the process of understanding how we can be an unfolding church, we understand that part of that includes comforting one another. We understand that part of it is this, this active enfolding must mean to maybe displace ourselves, make ourselves feel a little bit uncomfortable for the sake of another. You may wonder why we called this idea enfolding. Well, it's because we're, we're part of a flock, part of a fold. And so, we have a shepherd, a shepherd who has been tending to our very needs, and it is his voice that we yearn for. It's his voice that we find in the text, and it's his voice that we as a church, together in our 25th year together, we're seeking his, not only his face, but his voice to lead us and guide us. Last week, we heard the story of Hezekiah in chapter 38 and 39. And you may have thought I was a little rough on Hezekiah, but don't worry, there's a little bit of redemption for him in this week. We looked at Isaiah 39 as a means to set up the next few Sundays together. He was a man with a very short plan. His plan only included his own personal comfort. But we know that God has more in mind for us. And so as we come to the time of year where we seek God's face and we strive to hear his voice as we meet to make decisions as a church, may we find comfort in his presence. I thought to myself the whole time I read through Isaiah chapter 40, how comforting it must be to know that you are God's people. How it must have brought so much comfort just to know that he was with them. I think comfort comes from knowing that as God's people, we find three things. We find forgiveness, we find purpose, and we find hope for a future. Let's hear those words from his voice to his people. From Isaiah chapter 40, starting at verse 1, I'll read to the middle of verse 6. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sins have been paid for that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, and every mountain will be made low, and rough ground will become level, and rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people, We'll see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Is there any more uncomfortable or any less comfortable a place to be than a dentist chair. 
Well, maybe if you were sat in an emergency exit on a, a new Boeing flight, but um, th that may just be temporary. I mean it, though. Uh, who loves going to the dentist? I found someone this week. Pastor Nicole and I had a discussion this week about going to the dentist, and I discovered that about her. And it is, it is about the least comforting situation I can imagine for myself. For you, I'm not sure if it's a rock in your shoe, an awkward joke told by a colleague, watching Michael Scott at Dunder Mifflin, or starchy sheets, you know, just in that hotel that you happen to stumble upon. I think comfort, it comes in a variety of forms, but I don't think that God is referring to thread count. I don't find the process of change or even decision-making altogether comfortable. I sometimes need a warning or an invitation, a prompt, a reminder that everything will be okay. You see, Hezekiah was worried about past mistakes, I think. I think we all can get there. I think Israel is there. They find themselves, if you remember last week, be between the Assyrians, who are pressing on one side, and the Babylonians, who have just come for a friendly visit. Both really want to overtake them. They have been unfaithful, and God is reminding them that he is their God. Are you comfortable? You at home? Remember in COVID, you could just have, you know, first church of the bed sheets or what have you, and, you know, or second, you know, church of the futon or what have you, and it was really comfortable. It was a totally different level of comfort. Comfort. I've heard that the real problem with this generation is not the lack of things to make life easier, but it is the lack of difficulty. One famous worship leader has said that our idol today is comfort. I believe that Israel had that problem, but not this time. God says, comfort, comfort my people. We sometimes get that phrasing a little weird. I want you to think of it the way a parent may say to their child who's just fallen in skin to knee, they're there, my child. They're there. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she is received from the Lord's hand, double for all her sins. We've learned a few things together in our Bible class on Tuesday nights. If you want to join us, we start at 7. We learned on how the Bible was, uh, has come together throughout the course of time and how it was written. Hebrew poetry is, uh, Hebrew is one of the original languages in our Bible, and, and Isaiah would have been written in Hebrew. Much of Hebrew poetry, and um, even though this is more narrative, we find much of the poetic structure in the prophets as well. Their poetry loves to repeat things, much like English poetry does. Here we have it with the words at the beginning, comfort, comfort, my people. It's meant to emphasize what God's central message is. There's also repetition of the, the central idea. You'll notice the first line and the second line are similar. That's something else we find in Hebrew poetry. One line is repeated. And a very similar idea is kind of expounded upon or maybe emphasized. And we see that in a couple of examples here. Comfort, my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Also, her hard service has been completed. Her sins have been paid for, and she has received double for all her sins. It's been repeated for their emphasis. We be, need to be reminded, especially as we look back, it's difficult to find comfort in our past. Yahweh knows this. And the first thing that God needs to address with his people is this gap that exists between them. It's the gap of their sin. God is holy, and as a people, we are not. And we find ourselves with this large gap between us and God, and only he has the power to make up the difference. 
that word comfort in Hebrew is a pretty loaded word. It's given us a lot of trouble over the years. If you go to Exodus chapter 32 or even the book of Jonah, we've translated it relented. Even God changed his mind. We don't know what to do sometimes with this word, the idea that God changes his mind. But to our text, it gives us comfort because what it means is God has changed his mind about our fate, that our sin is no longer to be held against us. It was to be through the prophets and the kings that the law of God's presence was known. And Hezekiah, he was actually a king that helped to bring Israel out of some of these adulterous ways. If you look back as to what the double portion was required for, it was usually for sins of idolatry. If you were an idolater, you not only had to pay for your sins once, but you paid for them twice. Even their kings were not perfect, as we discovered last week. But there was always a desire for the king to come, as was the custom in the ancient Near East. There was a great comfort in knowing that you were a part of a kingdom. Yeah, you paid taxes and you showed fealty and submitted to some higher authority, but you had the benefits of belonging. It came with the benefits of protection. And God is gracious to Israel by reminding them that there's forgiveness for their sin that's already prepared, but also that he is their king. The text continues, the voice of one calling, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And it repeats, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain hill made low. The rough ground shall be made level, the rugged places a plain. You see the repetition again? The second place of real comfort is in the present king, is in the presence of God, knowing that they've prepared a place for him to be. As the wilderness is made less wild and straight paths are made through desert roads, we find that the truth of God and the presence of God is active as we, his people, find great comfort in knowing that he is there. Last week, we celebrated Pentecost, the time of a great comforter who is now with us. You see, we have the past, and speaking in the present, of the current work that is required for Israel to do, but there's also a future hope. As verse 5 says, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all the people will see it together. All the people. The future promises for the people of God come from God himself. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. The Lord himself has spoken. And we find future comfort. For myself, I find that there are at least three places that I can find myself rather uncomfortable when I look at my life. I believe that the text gives us the same guidance, actually. I become uncomfortable when I look at my past and I see mistakes and I hear words that I wish that I could have pulled back into my mouth and hurt feelings that I wish I could have comforted. I realize even now, currently, as I look at my present, my present state is so filled with busyness that it's easy to distract me from what can give me comfort and have been placated or become complacent. And instead of making roads or leveling mountains, we find ourselves busy with other tasks. And there are some days when I wake up and I look to my future and I grow increasingly worried about my ability to remain faithful to all that God is calling me to do. And when I look at a text like this, I am reminded that God speaks to our past, is here with us in our present, and makes promises of a future hope. I believe it's for this very reason that God put this on our hearts as we, as a prayer team, met a couple of months ago. Some of you received a text message from me 
probably six or eight weeks ago, asking you to pray for and pray over Isaiah 40 and for you to share some reflections. Those reflections are going to come out over the next few weeks because we are his people. This little series of unfolding messages is not coming from Isaiah. It's God, our King, who is drawing us together, giving us the work of leveling the highways. We all have a need to know that despite our past failures, that God is with us now and we have hope for a future. You see, my dental past was fraught with dismay. I realized as I, as I looked. I could not find any comfort just turning to myself. I had to turn to my community to find some comfort in my dental experiences. So this past week, as I sat in a chair, I decided to do that. I decided to expand my understanding of the dental community. I opened up about how uncomfortable I was about the whole process about sitting in a chair. Actually, I had a little bit of trauma, and the last one experience, I had some uh, dentist poking needles in my face, and for months, the, uh, it didn't wear off, and I was so worried about my ability to do my job or to be a public speaker or anything like that. It was, uh, I developed a lisp, and it was, for me, it was detrimental. With that fear, I opened up, and this trainee who was new to the scene, <coughs> she joined right in. <laughs> she says, oh, I hate going to the dentist. <laughs> I thought, oh, man, that's not going to go so well. Would have asked more questions if I didn't have three hands in my face. But she says, when I was a kid, I used to cry and scream. My mom used to have to pull me through the door. Now spit. <laughs> I spoke to my own mother about it. She recalled the horrors of dentistry when she was a child. Ten years old, fairly new to Canada, first dentist. I mean, probably not the first dentist ever, but he, he acted like he was. She told me that his hands were shaking more than her legs. <laughs> Wide-eyed and shocked as the wobbly needle ambled its way towards her gum line. She was confused as to who was supposed to be uncomfortable, him or me. Yeah. Maybe for you it's not the dentist. Maybe it's a crowded space. Maybe it's just being alone. Maybe it's the lonely place of feeling like you are under no one's jurisdiction and therefore no one is coming to visit. But there is no king, no one's coming. There's no friend to stop by, no need to make mountains low or to make pathways to our door. Don't worry about mowing the lawn or shoveling the snow at the front because no one's coming anyways. See, the church has become a home for comfort. But not the kind of comfort you get from fleece-lined slippers or silk sheets. It's not the kind of comfort that comes with extra zeros in a bank account or a week of extra vacation time. We have a need to comfort and still our very soul, our heart. And that's precisely what this text means. Speak to their heart. The image here of the Hebrew is of a God who is whispering in such a way that you, you hear it at a depth that can only be described as soul deep. If we have a need for comfort, and in this life, in this life and in this death, this comfort does not come from within. Jesus spoke of this kind of comfort. It's probably not the same comfort we have in mind. And as we explore chapter 40 a little bit further over these next couple of weeks, we'll start to understand what our job actually is, what our posture is actually is. You saw it at verse 6. It's a posture of curiosity, of imploring God, what 
what shall I cry? Hmm. One thing I would like you to notice about all three of those, I guess, movements throughout the text, the past and forgiveness, the present and work, the submission that's required, and the future, and the awe that comes with the hope, is that the banner behind me demonstrates the perfect posture for all three. We find the posture of one who seeks forgiveness in one who's submitting themselves before God. We find the one who's kneeling before the king with dirty hands as the level ground is laid out before him. And we see those of us who remember the words in Revelation as we behold his glory and cannot help but fall to our knees, proskuneo, in worship. This posture of humility and discernment is precisely where we find ourselves as a church in our 25th anniversary, in our 25th year. We are looking forward to a future that includes all that God is going to do. And we anticipate the future because of all that God has already done. The comfort that Israel has, Israel's comfort is that their, their sins are forgiven. What God is saying is that their sins are paid for. Even the most egregious one. And we can have the same assurance in Jesus Christ. We're about to sing it in a moment, but in the catechism written about 500 years ago, it asks, what is your only comfort? in life and in death. And our only comfort is that we are not our own, but we belong, body and soul, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who paid for all of our sins so we didn't have to. It reminds us of our place before God, and we can be assured of that salvation. And in response, we have opportunity to serve and allow other people to see the pathway for the king. And what will be the results? All people will see it together. Do you see that in verse 5? All people. Who? All people. They will what? They will see it together. The glory of the Lord. This work is not an exaggeration. It's not figurative. I know I've talked about poetry a little bit here, but this isn't figurative. It's literal. When a king would come, they would decide on the roads, and people would bandy together to make sure that the roads were prepared, that the pathways were available, that they were not rough, that they were smooth, because they wanted the king to come. In order to be part of a kingdom, they needed to be ruled by a king. And they encouraged the king to come and visit, and a road was the only way to ensure that the king would come often. Let us make that our prayer, that we make straight pathways for King Jesus to come to Curtis. The work that we are doing in this next year, just because our fiscal year happens to start in July, that we, we happen to move to this corporate worship, to a time of corporate discernment. So we have this time of worship together, and we move into this meeting where we continue in our worship. We continue in our meeting as God meets with his people. It will be a time for different kinds of worship where we decide some things about the future or where we believe God is leading us in the future. For we want to see his glory, not for our benefit, but for his. We've been doing this work of enfolding people over these last couple of months, and we know that God is going to continue to use these people because he uses all people to bring about his kingdom. Do you want to find comfort? I mean, like real comfort. The kind of comfort that rests with you even in the dentist's chair. 
Because I don't know about you, but it is in those moments when I am most afraid, when I am ashamed and when I am unsure of the promises of God that I strain to find that peace. What can give me comfort when I am so alone? Well, I found while I was wearing those undersized sunglasses, staring up at the TV mounted in the ceiling, cool idea, that tears were welling up in my eyes as over in my head, dentist drilled zing in the background. I recited, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Besides still waters, he leads me. I found the message from a very dear Christian friend. May the grace of Christ, may the peace of Christ comfort you. That's the first thing I heard or read as I came out of my appointment. There's not many places that I find less comfortable than the dentist chair. But for those of you who spend time in maybe hospital this year, maybe a hospital bed is what comes to your mind. Or an empty dining room table. But friends, remember that you are now, that we are now, his people. Your sins have been paid for no matter the size. The invitation for you to join in the work is already in the mail. And the promise of what is to come, you will, you will get to see. I'd always heard these words and remembered Isaiah chapter 40 is starting, comfort, comfort, now my people. I think Pastor Nicole and I decided that it was some hymn writer who put it in to make it easier for the choir to sing. I have entitled the sermon, Now My People. One, in hopes that you're reminded that the comfort that is promised from God that easily eludes us is there and always has been. But more so that you recognize that you are, that we are now his people. And Christ has come so that he may be with us and that is comfort. He forgives our past so that we can move forward. And that is comfort. He promises a future where all people may be his people. That is comfort. And it's worth the effort to make a road for a king like that. Because our only comfort in life and in death is that we are not our own but we belong to our faithful Savior, body and soul. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us already. We thank you for your faithfulness and your promises that even as we got to this place, we might have been weighed down by thoughts or ideas or worries or shame or guilt that you already had the promise for us that those are forgiven, that we can find comfort here. Thank you, Lord, that in the midst of our sin, you changed your mind, that in the midst of your holiness, that it would have been easy, Lord, for you to walk away, but you loved us so much that you sent us your Son, We thank you, Lord, that we may find our hope in you, our everlasting God. Be with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.